And at that point, you know, I, I was prepared just to cut him out of my life forever as, you know, a high school kid. And that was my plan. You know, I, I stopped seeing him. Um, I kind of just justified it to myself, like, okay, well, if you put your hand on a hot stove over and over again, it's stupid, right? You keep getting burned. That's kind of how I thought it was with my dad, you know, our relationship. Hello, welcome to Act Inspired Behavior, the show about real people and their real stories of transformation and change told through the lens of acceptance and commitment therapy. I'm Gabby Lanier. Do you ever look at other people's family and wonder, how the hell do they get along so well? They look so happy. I bet they go on skiing holidays and wear matching sweaters. And then do you compare them to your family? I've caught myself thinking, if only they would change, then we'd finally get along. I'd hazard to say that this line of thinking is common because, you know, I've thought it a time or two. And this type of thinking that, you know, your mind loves to indulge in can become this lovely chain in which one thought can trigger another thought that is then the antecedent for another thought or memory or feeling. And then that leads down this sometimes rather dark and twisty rabbit hole. But if I'm to trace it all back, I can usually pinpoint some conflict I'm anticipating or some memory of a disastrous family gathering or to a larger, more ingrained family conflict when that feels never ending. How about you? Taylor Gowan shares her story today about her longstanding conflict with her father and how that relationship changed and morphed over the years. Before we launch into this, I have to tell you that this conversation took place months ago. That original conversation that is. And it was amazing and so impactful. And then after we had a conversation, I realized I didn't record it and that I had forgotten to press record on our Zoom meeting. So, um, of course I was horrified. And then I emailed Taylor and she graciously rescheduled with me and we met again and we ended up re-recording that same conversation last January. And since then, I've thought and I've rethought about the lessons I've learned from Taylor's story. And this is personal, but you know, that's kind of the point of this podcast. This conversation has led me to heal a very long-standing internal and external rift between me and my brother, my brother John, who I've loved forever, my literal best friend from childhood through high school. Um, So several years ago, John met someone who he dated and married within a year and actually, it was it was strange because my, my husband, Andrew, and I had also met within two weeks of my brother and his wife meeting, and then they got married, and then Andrew and I got married three weeks after them. <laughs> a little freaky. But, you know, I could sugarcoat all of this for you, but I won't. I will tell you that I simply did not like the person he married. You know, I, I'd never clicked with her. She was serious and hard to talk to. And maybe also she didn't fit this vision of the person I imagined for my fun, loving, jovial, goofy older brother, who's also kind and generous. And I, I look up to, and it's not that I didn't try. I mean, I did. I tried so hard to understand her and get along with her. And I remember, you know, as they were planning their wedding, she turned to me at a restaurant and she asked me if I would be her maid of honor for their wedding. And I said, yes. And then that day came and she's walking down the aisle toward my brother, the man she was about to marry. I held my breath, you know, just kind of like, telling myself, keep it together, keep it together, Gabby, you can do this. And I remember my bouquet just shaking in my hands because the emotions I was feeling were just so intense, so overwhelming. And then I just started crying these like giant, wild alligator tears to the point where I ended up putting my bouquet in front of my face, hoping that everyone thought I was crying with joy, but I was crying with sorrow. 
I wish that I could tell you that I eventually accepted my brother's wife, that I learned to honor his choice. And again, I tried, or maybe I tell myself that, that I tried so damn hard, but I, I mean, I really did, but it just never happened the way that I hoped it would, you know, I just struggled over and over and over again over the years. And so many uncomfortable things happened that kind of just continued to worsen and never seemed to get better. And so by the time I interviewed Taylor last fall, um, it had been a little over six years that this rift had just grown between my brother and, and me. And, um, and at this time, my brother and his wife had actually separated. Um, they separated during the COVID pandemic. Still then, I struggled to find any way forward with my brother. Um, and even with, after his, the person who I thought had started all this conflict had finally kind of left this situation, I still experienced the same stress still dreading get togethers, still in the space of anger and hurt and shame about my feelings toward my brother. And then I realized, you know, it wasn't his wife that was the problem, really. It was that I wanted my brother to change, to be the person he was before all of this. Then I grieved that loss of who I thought my brother was and how I re- wanted our relationship to be. So I want to tell you what happened next, but first, let's listen to Taylor's story. She talks about the stress that came up for her in responding to that conflict between her and her dad, and then the various solutions she came up with to address it. Listen very closely to how her emotional responses changed, and as well as those ways of responding in order to reduce that conflict and that stress. And so perhaps in her story, you will guess how I am able to move forward. My name is Taylor Gowan. I'm a health services research specialist and an anxiety life coach um, from Indianapolis, Indiana. I know that you recently got married, right? Yes. Yep. We got married in September this year. Um, So we've been married for three months now, I think. <laughs> Did you ever feel that, um, before I move on, like when you got married, cause you guys were together for a while before, before you got married, mm-hmm. calling him husband or talking about him in terms of husband for the first time. Was that really strange? Oh my gosh, Gabby, I still don't call him my husband <laughs> as much as I can help it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. You know, I think you'll definitely have one of the the most memorable weddings when you go back and tell your your kids about it later on. We had a COVID wedding. Yeah. I mean, and to be honest, though, we had the best wedding I could ever imagine. So (laughs) even though it was during COVID, I wouldn't have wanted it to be any other way. Why is that? Um, it, it was just so special, you know, and and I guess like a lot of people really, I mean, I did, I stressed over the details for so long because we had like a a year and a half engagement and I wanted it to go perfectly and I was so worried about it and um, it went better than I could imagine it wasn't perfect but it was the best day ever (laughs) oh that's awesome Mm -hmm. so let's circle back around to your wedding later on in the conversation so we're going to hold on to that piece and we're going to segue a little bit so today you came here to talk about a story the story, the narrative between you and your dad, if you could think back to a time when you first started noticing that relationship between you and your dad, where would that start for you? Yeah, I think just kind of all along in childhood, um, I was the oldest child, the only daughter. So my, I know my dad was harder on me, um, you know, than, than my younger brother's Uh, And he had kind of this like authoritarian parenting style. Um, I remember my brothers and I like being afraid of him, um, you know, knowing he's like the disciplinarian. Um, I I do have a few good memories, you know, in childhood, like our, 
our 4th of July parties, you know, riding four wheelers in the backyard. Um, and then, you know, there's a, a, most of what I remember is, you know, kind of that punishment, that, you know, feeling distant from him, knowing that he was like really controlling and rigid. And he was so easily triggered like into anger and punishment kind of by the smallest things, you know, I, I remember sitting at the dinner table. Um, I spilled a glass of milk. I, I was, I had to have been like maybe seven, eight. Um, I got sent to bed without eating dinner because I'd spilled my glass of milk from my dad. <laughs> mm. I remember the next night being so nervous that I was going to spill it again, that I actually, I did spill it again. And, you know, same thing went to bed without dinner. Um, Self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. If you could describe one emotion on your end, what emotion did you experience when he was parenting in this way? Thinking about it now, I I just, I just feel kind of sad. I'm sure that I felt, um, you know, maybe like everything really was my fault and maybe that I wasn't being the right kind of kid, you know, that I was messing up or I was being too difficult. Not that I would have been able to label it back then, but anxiety for sure. Um, You know, obviously um, my favorite thing now is still like eating. So I wanted to be able to eat dinner with, you know, my brothers and with my dad and my mom. Um, And really I I didn't want to make him upset. you know, it was a big deal the night before. And yeah, I, I think definitely nervousness, worry that I was going to mess it up again. Okay. Yeah. And I, I think it's interesting because like, how does that kind of emotion change over time? Because when you put in that situation where you're like, it's your fault that something happened and then they react to you or whatever, you respond in a certain way and you have those kind of patterns of responding. And then I know for you, because we've talked before, this response changed for you as you started to get older. Maybe you held on to some of those things like that nervousness or that anxiety or the worry. But did you start feeling other things in addition to that? Yeah. um, Well, and I want to I want to clarify something, too. I said, you know, that I feel kind of sadness now thinking back on it and it's not just sadness for you know me the little girl me it's it's sadness for my dad too you know who who wants to be like that who wants to be the kind of parent that sends their child to bed over you know spilled milk um and I really I really think that he he thought he was doing the best he could back then um and you know he I mean he doesn't have probably the best memories either of raising, you know, his little kids. Um, so I'm, I'm sure there's sadness in it for him too, when he looks back on it. But I think, you know, as I got older, you know, that, that anxiousness, the worry, the, the sadness, um, I think, I don't think it changed a ton, but it, I think it intensified, um, you know, and I, and I did go through, a long period of depression and anxiety, you know, that really affected my life. Um, Probably like in my early high school years and kind of continued, kind of culminated. My parents got divorced when I was going into my freshman year of high school. And I was like happy and relieved. I don't remember ever crying about it. I remember kind of trying to hold back a smile. Um, yeah, and not that, and I guess, not in a sadistic way, I guess, but like, because I, I felt guilty for being happy and relieved, but I really thought, okay, this is going to be so much better. I'll live with my mom. You know, I won't have to see him very much. Um, little did I know that, you know, that's not really how joint custody works. <laughs> you have to go back and forth. Um, and, you know, my brothers and I did. And we really, my dad and I just kind of fought anytime we saw each other as I got older. Um, I just really kind of started to stand up to him 
Um, I was not choosing my battles wisely at that point. I was just kind of going off anytime, you know, he said anything. Um, and there was a point where I just, I stopped going over to see him. Um, you know, a, a lot of things happened back then that, um, you know, I, I could tell you it's, it, it, I mean, lots of things that were, my mom kind of likened it to like Jerry Springer episodes, right? Where it's like, how is that real life? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think it's like necessary for me to go through and say all of them. Um, I don't, I don't want to paint my dad as like the bad guy in this story because he's not like, he's a victim of, you know, how he was raised, I guess not a victim, but you know, a product, yeah. a product. Yeah. Of how he was raised. Oh, I love um, how you say that. That is, I'm so glad you bring that up because, I mean, each story has its side, right? Its own perspective. And, mm -hmm. but you're right. Like, he has his own story and his own history that has kind of led him to parent in that way. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned something earlier about how you felt sad for your dad because maybe, you know, he and he was doing his best, which, I feel like he'd probably really appreciate that. I mean, I, I do yeah. as a parent, you get to the point where your, your emotions take over and like you get into these patterns and it's so hard to change the way that you react to your own emotions. Mm. And then that kind of then reflects in your parenting and then you feel guilty about it. There's no perfect parent out there. So I really appreciate you saying that because I would hope my own kids one day would look back and say like, she wasn't perfect, but my mom did her best. You know, you get to a point where you you see that part of your parent and you can have that sense of empathy for them. Mm -hmm. And that's really beautiful. I'm glad that you said that. And like over the years, it sounds like you started pushing back more rather than acquiescing and saying like, oh yeah, it's my fault. It's my fault. Just kind of pushing back and saying like, no, I'm holding my ground here. You can't treat me this way. Or like you look back and say like, eh, I probably could have, you know, <laughs> held my ground in different ways, but this then led you to stop seeing him for a period of time. Right. Yeah. I know like, you know, in the, the court letters or, you know, however it works, it says that I would kind of, you know, go back and forth just like my brothers did. But I, I think it's, there was just some kind of like unspoken agreement that I didn't have to go over there anymore. Yeah. Uh, probably around like my sophomore year of high school. And, you know, I, I would hear about things that he had said to like my mom or my brother's through the grapevine. And, you know, I would write him these really angry letters thinking that, you know, I was really going to make an impact on him. He was going to see the error of his ways Hold and it beat to the fire. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, um, yeah, it did not happen like that, you know, but I mean, there were times when um, I remember, you know, specifically when I was in like outpatient therapy after I kind of went through really dark, battle with depression. Um, and he, you know, was like my, both my parents were there in that session. And I remember telling him like, you're not going to be at my wedding. You know, I was a teenager and I told that to my dad, like, I'm not inviting you to my wedding. You're not going to be walking me down the aisle. I don't even want you there. And I can like even picture his face right now. You know, I, I'm assuming it's his face, like where he's trying to hold back tears. Um, you know, he's hurt. He doesn't understand, you know, why I feel the way I feel. Um, he maybe doesn't even understand like how, you know, how his actions put us in this situation. And at that point, you know, I, I was prepared just to cut him out of my life forever as, you know, a high school kid. And that was my plan. You know, I, I stopped seeing him. Um, I kind of just justified it to myself like, okay, well, if you put your hand on a hot stove over and over again, it's stupid, right? You keep getting burned. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how I thought it was with my dad, you know, our relationship. And I remember, you know, when I, when I went to college, I went to a school that he did not approve of for a, like a, you know, a major that he didn't approve of. Um, I was going to go to, or I, I went for a semester at Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I wanted to do music. Um, and he just really, he kind of told me that I wasn't going to 
you know, amount to anything, that the field was too competitive, that I shouldn't even, you know, try, I should do something more realistic. So he refused to pay for any of it. He really just didn't respond to my invitation to come and visit or to help me move in when I first went there. And there was a ton of anger on my part. I felt so angry. I felt rejected. You know, I felt hurt and sad and just kind of unwanted. Like I could just never be enough for him. Yeah. Sounds like you there. I mean, there's part of you that's like distancing, 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 but there's, it sounds like there's still this like inkling of hope that because of your actions, maybe it would change the way that he interacted with you and that he might, maybe he'll change, like maybe be the bigger person or whatever. Oh, but that yeah. never seemed to happen. As you're starting to push back, maybe this is your strategy because the other things you tried weren't working in changing his behavior in the way that he interacted with you. You push, you push boundaries, you push buttons, you, you know, push back and then you distance. And yet, did any of those solutions work for you? With your dad? No, not the ones that I've mentioned so far. Absolutely not. And it, it was not for lack of effort because I, yeah. I was trying so hard. Like you mentioned, I, I tried cutting him out completely of my life. I tried yelling at him, writing those angry letters. I tried like tears, you know, crying and kind of telling him how I felt. I tried, you know, okay, like I'll just go and see him just to make him happy. Kind of obligatory visiting. Um, I tried doing whatever I thought would make him happy. You know, like you mentioned, like all of those efforts had the agenda of trying to change him into the person that I thought he should be, that I wanted him to be. And it was exhausting. Okay, I want to pause for a second. So far, Taylor has shared a few very important realizations. First, she told us about her emotions, how she experienced sadness and anxiety and worry about how her dad treated her and how her strategy for controlling those feelings were her attempts to meet his expectations, you know, to not spill the glass of milk, to not make mistakes that would lead to his disapproval. And then her emotions shifted as she got older. She began to respond with new emotions like anger and stubbornness and outrage. And her responses changed too. She tried something new here. She stood up to him you know, she challenged him, wrote angry letters, spent less and less time with him. And it got to the point where she was removing him from future experiences, like attending her someday wedding. All of this is understandable. It's logical, really. You know, when we feel pain, we do whatever we can to remove ourselves from it. Like Taylor said, if we feel pain when touching a hot stove, we take our hand away. We remove the pain. And that analogy works really, really well for physical pain, because clearly it's not safe to touch a hot stove, right? It's different when we start talking about psychological pain. In trying all of these different strategies and that attempt to control the pain, she tried her very best, really, to avoid it altogether. So have you ever been in this place of wanting to control how your loved one or friend or coworker treated you? Have you tried a million and one th ways to change their interactions with you? All with that same agenda of reducing or avoiding the pain of that hot stove. I invite you for a second to consider this little story to see if we can connect to this idea of experiential avoidance. So that avoidance of pain and discomfort that you experience internally and how it can lead to greater discomfort and not less. Okay, so imagine yourself on the end of a rope. You're holding on for dear life because on the other end, you are fighting an incredibly scary and powerful enemy. All of the bad feelings you've ever felt and will feel in the future. If you happen to win this tug of war game, you get to rid yourself of all those feelings forever. But if you lose, those feelings consume you. 
So you continue to fight and pull and struggle. Maybe you grit your teeth. Maybe you try harder. Maybe you'll simply tire out the enemy. But eventually you yourself get tired. All of your energy, your focus, your time, your effort goes into controlling this beast to tame it and make it succumb, all with this agenda of escaping those hard emotions. So think of your enemy now. For me, it's the fear that I'll never have my brother back, that I'll feel shame about my inability to love his wife or or now ex-wife, my guilt for not spending enough time with him, for not calling him back, for being jealous, I've spent years pulling on my rope, trying to rid myself of these feelings, but I've never won. I've never managed to strong arm my way toward changing anything other than to create more of the same pain. And meanwhile, I have grown so tired. How about you? Taylor recognized this in her relationship with her dad. She spent years holding on to that rope, right? So what is the solution to an unwinnable fight? What if she let go of the rope? What if I let go of the rope? What if you let go of the rope? Let's see what happens when Taylor lets go. Now, don't be fooled. She has definitely run back to that rope and then started that whole tug of war game over again from, you know, time to time. But now it's less frequent. So ask yourself as you listen, when one lets go of the rope, lets go of that struggle with pain, what does one do? How does one be willing to stand there, discomfort and all, and manage to live life with their mean, nasty feelings close by? How does this newfound freedom allow her to pursue her values, to forge new meaning in the aftermath? And so... Eventually, you got to that point, Taylor, where you're like, I've tried all the things and none of them are working. Mm-hmm. And when, when did that happen for you? Probably in my later college years, um, after I kind of transferred back to Indiana and kind of changed my major to psychology. And it was like a really gradual process. You know, I learned a lot in, in my psychology classes as well about, you know, positive psychology, um, gratitude, compassion, self-compassion, mindfulness, and even at the very end, acceptance and commitment therapy. I realized with all of, all of those resources that I knew the person that he, my dad is, and that he would continue to be. And that realization, like, didn't keep me from trying to change him or, you know, change his mind on occasion about things. But I think I realized at some point, that I could not make him be the person I wanted him to be. And there was nothing that I could do about that. No amount of effort, you know, no amount of of strategies, nothing could change him. And I really, you know, you, you don't need to. I think the change really kind of came in me. You know, I was working so hard to try to change him. And really, I just kind of worked on myself. I grew a lot um, and, you know, when I when I saw him from time to time, I really kind of stopped being so confrontational and trying to make him see how I felt. Instead, I just really, I, I really just listened a lot more. Mm-hmm. And I kind of understood what I had been doing wasn't helping, of course. I learned a lot just from listening to him, you know, a lot about his personality, kind of where, where he grew up, what environment he grew up in. Mm-hmm. you know, I kind of realized he doesn't have to be the person I want him to be in order for us to have a relationship. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's something like I'm, I'm really passionate about because I've seen what, what that acceptance of another person, like acceptance of, I would not have a relationship with my dad if I, you know, hadn't just kind of accepted. And when I accepted how things were, that I couldn't change him or the past, I couldn't make him see things the way I did. Like there were so many more options for going forward. It wasn't, okay, I have to cut him out of my life or I have to keep trying really, really hard. You know, I didn't have to hurt myself again and again with my control strategies. 
And as a result, I kind of had that mental capacity and space to think about what I really wanted from our relationship. And it wasn't, it wasn't like an easy road either after, you know, kind of coming to that place of acceptance. There were times that felt really awkward, didn't really want to go and, you know, sit through and and feel like all those feelings anymore. But oh my gosh, like, I just want to say thank you to like the, the girl that was me that had that wisdom when I was younger to continue trying to improve this relationship with my dad. Yeah. Because what we have now, it's not perfect, but it's, it's a meaningful relationship. Like if you were to close your eyes and think like, okay, what is a meaningful relationship with my dad look like? Even if he doesn't change at all, like, what does that look like for you? I, I mean, I value being kind to him. I value being compassionate to him, knowing and you know, trying to understand where he comes from. And I, I value um, being involved in his life. You know, I, I, and I, I want him to be involved in my life as well. Um, we were talking about Christmas earlier. If you could have shown yourself what Christmas would have looked like, would you have been like, that to me represents my values around my relationship with my dad? Oh, a hundred percent. How do those values look like when they're, when you see them in action? Oh yeah. I made Christmas with him a priority. And sometimes my dad gets left on the back burner for that. And this year we, we made a a point to spend most of the day with him and it meant a lot to him you know and we had a great Christmas this year with my dad um you know we had a me cry Taylor (laughs) (laughs) we made you know dessert (laughs) um and he he made this big feast for us too um nothing like he's done before so we we just we played games you know, we, we laughed, um, we shared memories, something that my dad said this Christmas, he, he stopped decorating for Christmas at all. You know, all the, the Christmas tree, all the ornaments from our childhood, everything is like in boxes in the basement. And he was trying to get me to just take it all. So I was like, if you're not going to use it, fine. I went down in the basement and I was just kind of looking at everything. And he came down there and we were just looking at it together and he pulls out like an ornament that had my brother's like handprint on it when he was little. And he's like, you know, looking at this stuff, it just makes me sad. He said he regrets that, you know, he didn't spend as much time with us when we were little, that he worked so much um, and that we just grew up so fast. And he said, that's, the reason he doesn't want to put the decorations up anymore is because looking at them makes him sad. We respond to these difficult emotions in some weird ways. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense. Like, you know, if you don't want to feel sad, then you don't put the ornaments up so you don't have to look at them. Yeah. So you don't have to feel sad. But then you don't get to feel the joy too. of the Yeah. You, you cut yourself off from the, the good side, the flip side of that emotion Oh, you know, that just gave me a chill. It's so true. Oh my yeah. gosh. And that's why, I mean, I was kind of waiting for you to talk about like when you distanced yourself from your dad, like when you cut him out. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. You cut out the direct conflict situations, mm-hmm. but then you also cut out what else with your dad? Oh yeah. I, I mean, anything else, right? All that was in my mind was like anger and resentment and bitterness because I didn't allow myself like the opportunity to produce something different with him. Right. Because I'd cut him out. And, you know, I really don't wish that it was, I really don't wish that it was too different because I don't think that it, you know, anything else could have produced what we have now. We have like this great history, like this long journey of, you know, screaming at each other of, um, (laughs) I mean, I think he feels kind of the same way. Oh, I love this conversation. 
I mean, yeah. we go through, we have to kind of go through these processes to see, in fact, that they don't work. And hopefully, if you've at least contacted some of those, you see their ineffectiveness and can reveal to you some of the things that you do care about. Before we end today, I have to, we have to circle back around to your wedding. You could have potentially, and you almost did, cut that part out too with like that experience with, with Christmas or with your wedding. What are some of the things ha- that happened that were very much aligned with your relationship that you want to have with your dad? <laughs> from the wedding he he gave this um really long toast he was the, he he was the one that went first and he he passed the microphone back and then you know took it back and said a couple more things and i have pictures of the moment and like i said it was perfectly imperfect i would not have wanted it to be another way he he was in like the wedding processional I wanted to walk down the aisle by myself. I don't know. It was really important to me, even though I felt felt bad, you know, telling him, I'm so sorry, but I just want to walk down by myself. He still walked down, you know, with his parents. Um, he stood in the front row and promised to support and to love, you know, me and my husband through our marriage. Um, He danced with us at the reception on the dance floor. Uh, We had our father-daughter dance. So many meaningful moments from the wedding. We have lots of pictures to document and remember that. You can definitely see. I would imagine most people would think him walking down the aisle, was it would be like your ultimate moment of acceptance for Mm -hmm. all of the history between you guys. And at the same time... It's kind of this ode to, I'm still me and I'm still my own person. And, you know, you're still yourself in this relationship. So you don't necessarily have to fundamentally change who you are as a person, which is fill in the blank for me, Taylor, walking down the aisle by yourself or your best friend and the man you love and you're about to get married. How would you describe yourself in that moment? Living authentically you know, being, being true to who I am, being true to who my husband is. And that means that we do things in unconventional ways. Like we think it's so weird that a father has to give away his daughter. Like, does he own her? No. (laughs) Ah, yes. It's so strange. So, you know, we, it's, it's being authentic. It is being, it's being afraid that people are going to think we're strange and judge us and doing it anyways, because that's what's true to us. My brother, he's 20 and he was the flower girl in our wedding. Um, and <laughs> it was perfect. It took a while to hit me. Uh, people for crazy. sure thought we were crazy. Um, and it was perfect. His girlfriend <laughs> filmed the whole thing. Like just so many weird things like that. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of a prayer, you know, at our re- reception, we did like a mindful moment. Yeah, lots of little things like that. And I know, you know, my dad, he felt included. He felt, you know, like a big part of our special day. I know I haven't asked him, but I don't, I don't think he would have wanted anything more because he loves that, you know, I'm stubborn just like him and I'm going to do things my way. I'm going to be authentic and sincere. (laughs) I think he's really proud for passing that trait on to me and I'm proud to have it. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, what a beautiful lesson for people to take away is you can change your relationship and make it better. And yet he doesn't have to change fundamentally who he is and you don't either. And that seems impossible. And yet here you are, you know? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Taylor. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, like, I've thought a lot about our conversation since we've talked. And um, there's actually another interview I did along kind of similar along the same lines around forgiveness with her father. Um, Mm -hmm. And these conversations have helped me so much with my own interactions and my own ability to forgive and to kind of repair and work on my relationships. So I want to thank you because you guys have really made a huge impact on me. And that Mm -hmm. gives me so much hope because maybe there's someone else out there who can listen to these same conversations and do that same 
work or know that they need to get there. That it's going to take a while. It's not like overnight and it's not a, this linear <laughs> progression, but maybe they can get there too. Exactly. It's Thank so, you. it's so worth it. I hope that anybody else that's listening, um, you know, to this in the future, I hope that this gives them hope for maybe difficult relationships that they have, um, knowing that it's just a series of really small choices, you know, changing your perspective just a little bit, maybe choosing to listen instead of yell, to listen instead of write angry letters, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's so, so worth it. So meaningful, even if you don't get the result that you thought you wanted or expected, because it can be so much more than, than that. And Gabby, I want to thank you for like being willing to listen to my story, to, you know, Hannah's story, to all the other stories that you've, you've done so far. Um, it's really cool what you're doing with these podcasts. Um, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. One more thing. How can people find you if they want to learn more about you and your coaching? Yeah, um, I have a website. It's it's just taylorgowan.com. So it's T-A-Y-L-E-R-G-O-W-A-N.com. That's my coaching website. Awesome. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Taylor. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your weekend and we will keep in touch and we'll talk soon. Yeah, same to you, Gabby. Thank you so much. In this episode, you heard from Taylor Gowan. She was brave enough and willing to share a story filled with mistakes and missteps and so much meaning. By finally realizing that all of her efforts of pulling and struggling on her rope with this agenda to make her dad change led her to the same old familiar struggle that none of these strategies managed to produce the ultimate goal of getting along that they only produced more pain, more struggle in the process. She got wise to the fact that nothing was working. She realized it was an unwinnable battle. That's when she finally started the work of letting go. For Taylor, the solution was not to try harder to have her dad change. It was to let go and begin the process of accepting her dad just as he is. In doing this work, she even cultivated compassion for her dad. It led her to understand through her work of listening rather than arguing, of sitting with those feelings rather than walking away. And in this work, she began to discover new experiences and new joy in it all. She discovered that what she really wanted wasn't for him to change, but for them to cultivate kindness and understanding, authenticity, and togetherness. And when she let go of the rope, she finally started living all of those values in action. In listening to her wedding story, all of those values come to life. And for me, being a very hormonal pregnant lady, I was just tearing up the whole time she was talking about her wedding. It was so wonderful. So, what would letting go of the rope look like for you? For me, it's picking up the phone. When I do that simple action, not only do I risk discomfort, I also risk feeling or not feeling joy. I risk feeling or not feeling laughter bubble up when my brother tells me another stupid joke. I risk being or not being a fun-loving auntie who wants to wish her niece a happy birthday. Good morning, Matthew. I can see you through my supervision hand monocle. If you are interested in reaching out and telling your story or would like to learn more through my blog, workshops, or coaching, find me on Instagram at actinspiredbehavior, email me at gabby at actinspiredbehaviorcoaching.com, or use the link listed in my show notes. I'd love to hear from you. I love you, Uncle John, and I, I hope after the coronavirus, I will come to your house. If this episode resonated with you, subscribe to this podcast and stay tuned for future episodes. And please take a moment to rate and review this show. It's so helpful in getting others to find this show. Thank you so much. Hi, Matthews. I can't wait for the corona to be over so you can come over and play in our house. Bye-bye, Uncle John. I love you. Hello again. I want to take a moment and say that this podcast is for educational purposes only. 
Content and conversation provided in this podcast should not be taken as a replace professional or therapeutic recommendations. As a board-certified behavior analyst, my goal is to disseminate ACT and behavior analysis to the wider public and have meaningful conversations to further explore our understanding. If you are concerned about your own personal well-being, I encourage you to seek out the help of a licensed professional who can provide individual support to you. Thank you so much. Have a good day. I love you, big guy.